Alrighty. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad right now to be joined by Leila Zand, who is an Iranian-American scholar and act- activist focusing on peace and justice and anti-war activism, specifically on Iran and U.S. relations and the Middle East, with expertise in interfaith dialogue and nonviolence communications. She immigrated to the U.S. from Iran in 2000, and she works with Code Pink and the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Leila, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I, I wanted to ask you on, uh, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of news about Iran right now, specifically because of what happened recently. Uh, Masa Amini, or, or also known as Gina, I understand that she's Kurdish and her, her real name was, her given name was Gina, uh, was targeted by the morality police on September 13th and later died after falling into a coma. And first of all, I, I, I wanted to get some of the backstory here because I feel like anything that's coming up into the U.S. about Iran is going to be twisted. So I wanted to get your specific, uh, your specific uh, um, kind of context to what's going on here. What do we need to understand about the situation vis-a-vis the the rules around uh, how women can appear in Iran and the morality p- police uh, vis-a-vis this this particular situation? Um, I studied history, so I. I... I really am interested in genealogy and the historical background. So um, since 1979, that Islamic revolution took place, um, the um, conversation around hijab or covering or women covering themselves has been a, um, a very tense conversation among two different groups. One majority of people, or I say average people in the streets, and um, the ayatollahs the leader of the Islamic revolution, Khomeini, then when he was in Paris before he comes to the into Iran, in his conversation, he talked about, um, you know, having freedom in Iran and nobody has to, although it's an Islamic revolution, but nobody has to go specifically on Islamic um, uniforms or Islamic, um, um, you know, law. But when he came, of course, almost everything has changed. I want to point out at the Iran-Iraq war because immediately after the revolution, the war took place and a lot of people had to keep quiet because the unity, because they wanted to have the unity around the flag, Um, you know, fighting with the enemy, basically who invaded part of our country in southern part of Iran. So that was a problem that started from then and i was then i was very young maybe i was not even in first grade but in the first grade i went to school without any um, head cover without any head job by little by little uh, throughout my elementary school um, the uniform changed and that was a conversation at the beginning of the revolution at the beginning after the revolution actually a couple of demonstrations took place by women that they were opposed to the hijab to the mandatory hijab and it was a kind kind of nobody was was sure that what kind of law or islamic law or hijab law is going to be on the uh, new constitution or not um and a couple of demonstration took place by women it was and then as, as i said when the war took place every everyone kept quiet and nobody talked about that anymore in at the when Khomeini died at the end of 80s uh, so it was a revision to the constitution this this time the um idea of hijab came to the constitution that women had to cover themselves but it's not anything um particularly talking about what kind of covering and you know, and it, it's depend, it depends on people's um, definition of what hijab means. I should say the, this is um, based on my personal observation, majority of people who I, I see in Iran, they are not religious. This must be interesting because a lot of people, specifically in the United States, they think um, Iranian people are very religious. They are not that religious. I've traveled all around the Middle East also, and I've, you know, 
this, these are all personal um, observation. When I look at the people around, when I look at the Iranians, when I walk in the streets, I see at least from the perspective of me as a woman who grew up under the Islamic, Islamic Republic, I see Iranian people at least in the surface, at least the way that they cover themselves. They are not religious at all. And then in two years ago, to, now is in 2020, it was a study by the Iranian Majlis or parliament that they did the study to find out how many percentage, because the idea of hijab is still, as of, you know, from the beginning to this day is a, um, is a kind of battle between two, three different groups. So Majlis finally, the parliament had his um, study in 2020 and found out that only 20% of the Iranian women of all Iranians are interested into hijab, into mandatory hijab. So they came to the, and this became a high level conversation among other people in the office, in the government to find out what should we do? Because some people talk about those 20% are very powerful. And, you know, they are the one who are connected to the government. They are the ones who make main decisions. But at the same time, I should say my last trip to Iran was in 2018 before the latest president. It was during President Rouhani. I couldn't believe the way that I saw women are covering themselves. Basically, it was not any cover. It was kind of very small, you know, material in top of their hair. I was the one who was most covering that all my friends and family who whomever I saw and that is basically not just me people who travel from abroad when they go to Iran they cover themselves more properly because of the experience that we have you know um let me put it in the parenthesis right now I was 12 years old I was arrested by this morality police myself that why I'm showing some of the hair or one time because I had nail polish so it was very tough when I was growing up there but now little by little specifically after the reformist era after president khatami came to office in 1997 these the society has changed a lot there are a lot of openings you know people are um, have a freedom on what to wear what to do and specifically on women but that was until last year apparently since um, the latest president came to office, President Raisi, um, the morality police, which always was present when I was growing up in Iran, their presence became um, more obvious in the streets. This is in my time, they had a like SUV for, you know, soldier for soldier with the soldiers uniform, with the army uniforms, they came to the street and just reminded us that, you know, our hijab is not good, we should cover ourselves better, or, you know, sometimes if it was really bad, or if we had a makeup, or we had bright clothes on, um, they would take us into their um, offices in the police department. And so it was very scary, specifically, you know, going to the police um, offices, you know, as a teenager, it's very scary by itself, you know, this is for criminals, not for you know, an average woman for criminals who sell drugs, who kill others, who, you know, these, these are the crimes that often people think about going to the, um, their office. But anyway, now, uh, since uh, Raisi came to the office, and specifically we learned last week that it was a behind a closed door meeting, and nobody knew about that till recent, recently, Raisi specifically asked her, his um, um, uh, um, officers, his um, ministers, that we should um, focus on hijab again. People are not, you know, following the rules and, you know, all of those things. In the past couple of, maybe in the past two months, I have been very worried myself because of the videos and the films that I saw is coming from Iran. Because in my time, it, it, it was the specific department that took care of the, you know, people with the bad hijab. Now, uh, police is doing that. And police is not trained for doing any of these activities. So it was the videos that it was viral 
and I saw like in one of them, they were just pulling a woman and it's the hijab supposed to, you know, cover yourself, not to showing, you know, your hair or your body parts. But they were pulling a young woman into the streets on, on the you know, ground. And she, actually one of her clothes, her shares came off because, you know, they were pulling her into the car, into the police car. It was devastating looking, looking at these pictures. I was very worried myself. And I, I thought, what a stupid idea, you know, because of many reasons. One, of course, because of the humanities reasons, because of the disrespect to, to people and specifically to women. Again, men should make a decision to what women should wear, what women should do. And that is also, besides, Iran is experiencing a very difficult time right now. Financial condition, you know, economy is really bad. People are suffering because of the financial situation in Iran due to the sanctions. And a lot of people have, a, you know, if they have a specific sickness, like the patients, um, for example, the cancer patients or even patients who were um, suffering from chemical weapons that was used by Saddam Hussein during the war still are around and still are suffering and they don't have adequate medications. You know, the cancer patient don't have a medication. So people are really battling for the necessity and the simple things in life that they deserve for every single day. And we don't need to add this misery to their life. This is besides all of those things that I already said. So I saw a video, for example, in a woman was begging these police people the members of police and said please my daughter is sick please don't take her and they just grab and pull the girl into the uh, their car so i don't know what happened in their car apparently they bring like mini buses and they get all these women into that and they take them into a um, center which they suppose code and code teach them um or how to prepare you know properly wear dress or how properly cover your head. Sometimes we have seen that they actually hit these women in, the, in these films we have seen, or they, want, they pull them and push them so they don't care about their safety. And it's, it's, very, it's very ugly scenes that you see they do to another human being that deserves respect, deserve, you know, so anyway, um, on that day, apparently, uh, Gina, or um, I think her Kurdish name is Gina, um, or Mahsa, um, was from Kurdistan of Iran, Kurdistan in northwest of Iran. So they traveled to Tehran um, for vacation or for, for whatever it was. And um, this happened to her. So morality police came in front of her, apparently, you know, discussed with her hijab and everything. They put him in, into the van and took her into that specific office. We don't know what happened. They showed a film that she was okay in that, it was the cameras that it was, she was okay. I don't want to pay attention to any of them because my main problem is you don't have a right to make a decision for these women to what to wear what. And she was with her parents, apparently. Her parents follow her to that specific office. So what have ever happened to him? Still, we don't know because her parents said, you know, she was okay till that moment. And then the police said we didn't, you know, do anything to her. So any, anyhow, whatever happened, unfortunately, she lost her life under the police custody. She was there. We see in the cameras, the hidden cameras that are there, they opened it to public. We see that she comes to talk to one of those ladies for a second, police women for a second, and then she holds her, her head and um, she collapses. And then she goes to the hospital and after a couple of days, unfortunately, sorry, unfortunately she lose her life. I, I say there is a conversation among people. I was, before I come here, I was on the clubhouse. Iranians are 
you know, frequently go to clubhouse and they talk. I was there and it was a conversation between two groups of people. One group said, well, she was sick already such and such a year. She had this surgery and she had a problem already. You know, she was not that healthy. Other groups said, oh, she was healthy. This happened on, you know, the police beat her up and this happened. My, my, you know, idea is we don't want to know if she was there, if you didn't get her or whatever, if anything happened to her, her parents were responsible or her, her family were responsible. We don't care if she was sick or not. She, you are not allowed to, you know, control people's life. This is my main, you know, just argument on this. But anyway, that was the trigger for this series of demonstrations that is taking place and sometimes and so far actually the news is coming from iran in many different cities people argue the police brutality is not as much as they have seen before in some some argue that um you know on um on the other side, you know, they, like everything is controlled by the government, including the TV and radio, and we never heard any other stories than the government's story. But this time, they invited people who were not allowed to go to, you know, to the TV and talk, to the um, radio and talk. They invited people, quote unquote, opposition members of the Islamic Republic to go there and have a conversation and talk about their own perspective of, of these ideas. This is a huge step in, in my mind because they never accepted any other voices except themselves. And some people, you know, argue that um, these kids, you know, the, the things that we know so far, apparently um, people who are in the streets are very young, under 30 years old, um, people um, who've never seen you know, revolution, war, and those are my generations. But these people in the streets are very young, in their 20s. And some people argue that um, these young people, they don't have any hope because you know, of the economy, because of the situation they have been facing, because of the dictatorship that they never had the voice. Now they really don't care what happened happened to them. They said either we are going to make the change we want or, you know, we die. These are the arguments I hear from the Iranians, you know, there on the streets. Um, as I should also add, unfortunately, since yesterday, the Internet is blocked in Iran and we don't hear a lot of new voices. These are most people who are talking. They are hearing it, hearing these stories from others, from their family members or friends inside Iran. But these people themselves are outside. So um, but what makes me really concerned, specifically with the experience of Syria and, and Libya and, you know, these civil wars that we have seen is first of all on the first day that this happened because Rina was from Kurdistan of Iran and Kur Kurdish people you know there are groups from that area that they are talking about separation separation of Kurdistan and these people get support from you know financial support and technical support and technical support from outside including Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. So on the first day, they started to have, you know, like um, Iranian-speaking, Farsi-speaking media outside of Iran, mainly in United States or Europe, including, um, you know, like BBC or um, Voice of America. These people, these um, channels interviewed Kurdish separatists from these groups, and they said, oh, they have killed, you know, they wanted to misuse Massa or Gina's name for their own interests and then their own benefit. And they started, you know, they had the um, Kurdistan flag instead of Iranian flag, and then they came they had, um, you know, just in these conversations that, oh, they killed another Kurdish person. But the idea, you know, Massa, this happened to Massa not because he was Kurdish. This happened to her because she was a woman. 
And, you know, and that could happen to anyone. As I told you, that happened to me when I was 12 years old. That happened to many other people. But these people wanted to use that. I was very worried about this. Another thing that makes me really concerned is, you know, there are two different groups in Iran right now, pro and against this, you know, government. Basically, majority of young people who are in the street, who are tired and have right to have the demonstration. And in Iranian constitution, it gives right to people to do nonviolent demonstrations, but they need to get a permission from the government. Government doesn't give them permission, but gives permission to those who support them, which they had the permission to do that today on Friday and after Friday praying. They did the demonstration against the quote unquote, they call it riots and against these demonstrators. The problem is right now, what makes me concerned is the civil war, of course. And because of these people who do the demonstration, like this young generation who are tired and have right to do them demonstrations. Unfortunately, there are individuals among them who started to make some violent actions and they burn, you know, stores, they actually burned a policeman in one of the cities, they, you know, destroy public, you know, stores, um, gas stations, and whatever belong to public. And these are very wrong, I believe, because of two main reasons. One, these kind of violent acts give permission to the government to use violence and says, okay, you are destroying these things that belong to the to everybody, to the public, and then you you know they can shoot at these people. And also, you know, it's just of course violence is bad in no matter who use it and against them. Is something that um, it doesn't have a good result. It never had a good result. I'm very worried about that. And I give absolutely right to people who demonstrate, who rally, who, you know, says whatever. My suggestion was please take off your scarves, everybody, and just go into the street. You don't have to burn, you know, gas stations or buildings or cars to show you are opposite to something to show your opposition but also there are a lot of people i love those scenes that i've seen in the videos that um, some young people they take, take their scarves and they burn them which is very symbolic and i think it's beautiful and i i, I love to support them and i do that except the violence you know that they that it's taking place sometimes unfortunately so well, thank you. Thank you for all of that, that, that uh, context. I think that's very helpful. I am curious uh, because um, I want to, I want to understand, and I think the listeners would like to as well to understand what hijab can mean for different people. Uh, for instance, I saw a, a poster and I, I of course don't speak Farsi. So I am assuming that the person on online translated it correctly, but uh, it's, it's, it shows a woman wearing hijab and it says with your hijab you cut the hand of imperialism and it's a poster from the late 70s the early 80s and it talks about how the hijab was used as a symbol not only of islam but uh but against imperialism so i'm curious if you can if you can talk a little bit about how hijab is is a symbol for a, a few different things that people might relate to in different ways uh in iran yeah um yeah they sometimes say that and they said hijab brings um safety you know there are these are the slogans or it's fighting with imperialism that is specifically I, ha I haven't seen this one that you mentioned but it makes sense i can you know understand if there is something like that and the main idea is uh, in early 20th century the you know, the, before the revolution, we have the Pahlavi dynasty, the late Shah. His father, who was the king, the Shah of Iran, in early 20th century, 
in the uh, process toward modernization of Iran, this is another, it's very interesting, the hijab and women in Iran. By force, he took scarves out of women's head. So women were not allowed to cover their head. Uh, you know, my grandmother or great grandmother talked about it and said, you know, for weeks, I didn't want to go out because all my life I covered my hair and now I was showing my ears and my neck, you know, to people I was very uncomfortable. Yeah, or, you know, the, in Iran, it was a lot of public bath. And that is the time that the private bath inside of home actually started to be built because women didn't want to go to public bath. They didn't want to go out. So it was by force. And the idea of hijab in general, um, before, Islam, before Islam comes to Iran, you know, Islam came to Iran in 680, in almost 1400 years ago. Before that, Iranians were Zoroastrians. Zora, you know, they practiced Zoroastrianism. So in that time, they, um, for Iranians, in a, for women in a higher level of society, when they wanted to go out, they would have covered themselves, their head. Or, you know, if they went to the, um, like, very special uh, gatherings of places, like today in Christianity, when people go to the church, they cover their head, a little thing. So that was the sign of respect for everyone. Um, but it was not hijab. In Islam, even, there is an argument among scholars. Some people said in Quran, it says only uh, tell the prophet um, to um, tell his wives to cover yourself. It doesn't say cover what and what part of your bodies. And because of that, there is no um, solid you know, understanding and what does that mean. Um, personally, based on what I've heard, most of the idea of hijab is coming from, you know, men, patriotism, and they want, they want to control women's body, basically. And it, I actually, I was very surprised when I traveled into the Middle East and I found out there are many different Muslims <laughs> and uh, many different um, idea of hijab because in Saudi Arabia uh, and in Afghanistan hijab that means you know people cover even their face and hold their body in Iran majority of people who are really religious and they want to cover themselves the only areas of their body that they can show is their face. So that means they cover their hair totally and their neck and everything. So mainly like nuns. So they can, they can show their face and their hands. And, but, you know, the, this this was the main idea for hijab and when i went to school it was like that we had to you know cover every part of our body but but this two sides in two parts like hands and face but now because it's by force actually a lot of religious people are very disappointed as well they said these women who are wearing hijab this is not hijab because you show all your hair and you just have a pretty little things on top of your head and you call it hijab or covering your hair but basically this is the way you are disrespecting hijab and disrespecting the idea of you know of hijab but and these are you know all these conversations but back to what you said on imperialism i guess most of the time specifically this was the conversation after the islamic revolution that they refer to the father of the late shah reza shah his name was as a pop and shah himself as a puppet of the united states or big powers mostly himself as a puppet of the united states and his father as you know puppet of the imperialist or the big powers like British then then and um, so because he did that by force um, took the hijab out of women's head 
and then later his um, son although he didn't do by force but the advertisement also you know any woman who want to be successful they should be modern and modernity means showing your head and showing you know and me because i went to school all 12 years i went to um uh, you know basic education was in iran what i learned that you know in the, in your in outside world in america and in europe uh, women are not respected because they are used as a you know just a pleasure tool for men because you know they show their hair they show their body so this was my understanding of how uh, women are in the west and I am the good one because I don't let men use me as a tool. So I cover myself and all of those. But, you know, I didn't know that they are using me also because they are forcing me their opinion on me. So these are the um, I think that makes it a little bit more complicated. And a lot of women also talk about this. I said um, if the late Shah, his father, um, by force took this scarf out of women's head now you are putting it back by force and you never give women to choose themselves so that is a main problem right yeah it's like just the, the problem isn't that they're they're not wearing it or that they're wearing it the problem is that you're forcing it either way and people should have the right to choose to dress however they like to dress <laughs> yeah and however it however it means to them. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's very interesting too, that, that that people who are religious in Iran, which again, you said that there aren't that many uh, from what you've seen, feel that oftentimes the way that hijab is forced on people is a like the, the way they wear it is disrespectful because you're wearing mm -hmm. it wrong. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, that's also a very interesting point. Um, I kind of, I, I wanted to circle back a little bit to these protests because something that I've been seeing, and again, not only am I seeing it several people removed because now there's no internet, but also because I don't speak Farsi, uh, some of the things that I'm seeing are that, um, you know, Kurdish people are treated more poorly uh, than regular Iranian citizens. And so that this is something that needs to be discussed in Iran. Uh, also, see, hearing that um, that there are there are demands that basically uh, this government be replaced, and that that to me as an American is worrisome because that's what the U.S. wants. I'm I'm curious, like what what are what do you feel like are some of these demands, and do you feel from your experience that there is something in this that Kurdish people are treated poorly in in Iran? not because they, yes but not because they are kurdish you know there are in um, borders of iran all of the regions at the borders like kurdistan of iran or even the um southern parts um that we had a war like um the khuzestan and the other side baluchistan all of these areas because are the borders you know that was my argument and this is what they told me i said you know why they are so poor it, especially because they suffered throughout the eight years of iran iraq war they suffered really badly and now they deserve the best but this was the argument i heard from some people who work in that area they said um, basically because always there is a tension there in the in the borders and specifically they are under target from the outside Word, as I mentioned, you know, separatists. Often government, and even in the previous government also, they never want to spend a lot of money there. They are always worried that, you know, if they spend more money, the money will be gone immediately if anything happens. This is their argument. I think it made some sense some but you know they, they deserve of course much better i i was in tehran as i said in 2018 i actually met a couple of kurdish educated young boys who came to tehran and work in the restaurants and other places because there is no job and there was no job but i want to say just put it in the perspective of the iran today iran is suffering from you know very bad economy and this is not the only Kurdish, everyone is suffering, but also the areas in the borders that traditionally have had not 
as comf have not been as comfortable as people in the major cities with Esfahan, Shiraz, or Tehran. So they are suffering more, of course, because you know if people don't have a job in Tehran, um, let's say they used to come at least in Tehran to get a job. Now there is no job in Tehran either. So I want to say this is in general, um, but you know right now for example i see um that a lot of people in majority of iranians of course don't speak kurdish but a lot of people in different streets in various cities in iran they are and their slogan is in kurdish um, as a respect to uh jina or massa uh, so you know, they, their slogans in the Kurdish, they just, even people from Azerbaijan of Iran, you know, Turkish people and others. So I want to say yes, but that doesn't mean that because they are Kurdish, because they are not equal, because they are, you know, it doesn't mean that. Um, but everyone's, everyone's life in Iran is, is in a very tough time. But um, your, your second question was, um, yeah, basically, I you know, I, I respect everybody's right to choose uh, a government and the United States government does not respect that right. And so yeah. if the demands on the street are yeah. for a different government, are you worried that the U.S. might try to use that to further uh, weaken Iranians uh, government yeah. by through violence? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I I think actually what I told you about the violence that is used by some people, there is some argument that these are not average Iranians who are using violence. These are the people who want to make it into really a civil war style, to make the government really weak in order to have the change, the force from outside. So um, I, I and I believe that because, you know, people like you and me, even if we are so angry, we cannot kill someone if we are not, if we you know, are not meditated from, you know, before or trained previously or no, you know, there are some channels that they show how to make um, model, of, uh, what is that, model of cocktail? and those things to make a fire they show how to beat the policeman off these are not average citizens these are people who get support either financially or you know technical and tactical from outside and i would say from the united states as a as a top but then also others um these are the people who want everything to get worse and I am very much worried about that. And this is why, you know, I always argue with these people online when they are, I said, just stick to your, to your demand on hijab. Don't expand it into other things. Because first of all, those who want to see the civil war, to get to see you weak, to see you, you know, are destroyed from within. These are those people will get so happy and the government will get so happy because they can use force against you. So, yes, I am very worried. And I think if you tell me there are a lot of hands at work right now to use this opportunity on for the benefit of Israel and the United States, I am not surprised. I believe that because, you know, I see things like, for example, burning a policeman, burning, you know, it, the policeman probably is your neighbor, is your family. If you go at the end of that and dig into it, it's someone that you know, it's your citizen, it's your, I don't know, just na your neighbor, probably. How can you do that? And if you are, you know, even if you are that angry, but there are people who have who have been trained for these moments and we know israel has a lot of influence in iran you know how many iranian scientists have been killed by israel and how much money the us is spending to for the regime change in iran what is better than this that people are doing the hard work themselves so yes i am worried very much <clears throat> so finally kind of wrapping up here i'm curious like what what would be your hope both as an iranian and an american 
Uh, what would be your hope for Iran? And also, what would be your hope for the United States in terms of relations with Iran? And when, what would you like Americans to understand about the situation? Uh, sometimes I would like to close my eyes and think that I'm in the, you know, my own imaginary world, the world that I see. You know, a lot of Americans come to Iran and visit Iran. It's so beautiful. It's a very beautiful country. They come and then I see that, you know, they are celebrating their friendships. I like to, for Ira a lot of Iranians to meet with Americans. I like, I like to have, to see a normal relationship rather than uh, lack of any relationship and creating a creature in our mind from the other side that doesn't understand us and doesn't know our story. I want to see an opportunity that people hear each other's stories and listen to one another. So people apologize, you know, to one another for everything they have done to each other, at least, you know, in, in the past 50, 60 years that we have been around. And then um, I would love to see all of those. I, I and I, I love to see this event um, ends with a success. And success to me, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'm that old that I think just gaining a little bit is wonderful. So people right now, for example, let me go back there. People in the streets called for the end of the regime, for the death to Khomeini and all of that. So just because you are angry at the, you know, the mandatory hijab, you are not going to the, you know, do the regime change. Just if you gain this freedom for your own body, if you get the right to make a decision for your own body and how to dress, this is a big success. And then non-violently, we can go forward and the next step and the next step and the next one. But this is happening today and um, I am, makes me a little worried, but I'm thinking if one day, you know, I don't know, should I still talk about JCPOA? I, I'm not hopeful at all. <laughs> but, you know, if happens or not happens, I would love to see a day that these governments even, you know, they visit each other's countries. They open a um, embassies, their embassies in one another's countries. I would like a day that if I wanted to take my daughters in, in Iran, their friends don't tell them that, but you are an American. If you go there, they will, you know, they will get you, they will arrest you. Or I, I want to, you know, right now, today I was talking with these friends and I was thinking, I wish I could go there. I'm scared to go there. You know, and here I'm scared to talk about anything. You know, it's it's like our 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 world is getting a little um, suffocating. I guess sometimes we have a lot to talk and we have a lot to um, just uh, discuss with one another. But sometimes it's very difficult. The fear is everywhere. Yeah, I like to see, um, like you guys in Europe, you, you, you know, you just travel easily here and there. So I would love to see, every, you know, everywhere in the world to be like that. No visas even. <laughs> no, um, you know, permission from someone who doesn't know us, the government, the, you know, that they create all of these obstacles uh, for us not to know each other. Yeah, very, very well put. And I just have to ask one, I know I said that that's the last question, but I just have to ask one question, because one of the things that <clears throat> that I speak a lot about is the end of US empire, which would not be, you know, like you, you were mentioning, like you take one thing, like the hijab, and you focus on that. And you say, like, let's change this one thing. And I feel like for, for me as an American, I oftentimes say that, like, I just want the US empire to end, because the whole thing is just Horror. It's, it's it's the largest terrorist organization in the world um and that's not like one thing it's not like hey let's just get universal health care although i do believe in that too but um and so i'm curious like what would you say to someone who says that but like think this is the, the it's too rotten there's like too much wrong to just say let's change one thing like what would you say to someone who who, who makes that argument you know um 
I only would say, yes, a lot of people also before us wanted to do that. They couldn't do even the small step. Let's let's let us think about like, for example, the black movement, the civil rights movement here in the United States. It has been a long path and still, you know, the black community are suffering still they've been killed here and there with no consequences for others but i've been in this country for 20 years i see a huge change even in that area you know but and they wanted to get just to um, right to vote 40 years ago 50 years ago 60 years 60 in 60s but you know, they got it and for a while, maybe they were happy, but they learned very soon that this is not equality. Still, they have a long way to go. And then this generation came and they came with another step forward. So I think I see maybe it's not it doesn't happen in my time and your time, but maybe in our children or children of children, you know, time, but still is, is a very strong step. And if we want, I always think if we want, yes, I don't like U.S. imperialism. But at the same time, I think if we make a little awareness about the money the United States spent for a war machine, the money that this country spends, actually this country has changed a lot toward worse, a lot of ways toward worse since I came here. And I see that the money that is spent in the elections you know, these are the things that if we change them, if we really structurally change them, that would be a big success. Because if we bring someone into the office, can can vote for no more, you know, money for war, no more money for, you know, other things that basically war again, <laughs> and instead going for a lot of other things that people need. You know, sometimes you know. In, I went to in Iran in 2018. A lot of things with that economy in Iran was much, much better than the United States with that economy. You know, and we can make these things to change. But if we go for a very big one, yes, UN, U.S. imperialism is very ugly. You know, if people in the Middle East they know it very well, firsthand. You know, U.S. militarism is very ugly. And, you know, we know it in first hand. But at the same time, if we go by that, I guess our voice will be not as loud as can can be reached to people, to those who can make a decision and to those who in other otherwise we could change their mind. People like ourselves, our neighbors, our families, we can change their mind. Um, this is, it came to my mind right now, but, you know, I'd love to see one day in my lifetime that this situation is changed. I, I would love to see it, but we see, you know, right now, how many percent of people is still are thinking about Trump and how many people are still supporting him. So we need to make a huge change in the education system in this country to make you know people those people who really vote for trump and still are thinking if he comes they vote for him again so we need to make the change in their mind and that is only by education by you know opening their mind toward the real life and real world so and they can help us by that and we can be bigger group and then destroying imperialism i guess is it will be easier maybe if we are more <laughs> well thank you um i feel like i've taken up a lot of your time now but um is there somewhere where you would uh uh tell folks to look for uh for news about iran that you feel is more fair than obviously what our corporate media shares is there somewhere you'd recommend people look for that um, there is um, I, the two Iranian ones, uh, Iranian Americans that I listen myself. One is a Nayak National Iranian American Council in their websites, and they also on are on the Twitter. Um, there is another one is Iran podcast. It's uh, a podcast that uh, discuss many different matters about Iran. Um, 
and I also recommend that. Um, I have a Twitter also. I tweet mostly about Iran. Um, I'm not really that active, but I, I, you know, right now these days I post at least I tweet like two, three uh, tweets a day or sometimes week. <laughs> uh, so Leila for peace. Um, that's my Twitter. So that's it, I guess. Um, Code Pink also in their website and in their mailing list. Sometimes we send out some information, but it's not regularly on Iran. CodePink.org, people can check that as well. Okay, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of the insight and all of the context. I think that's super thank helpful. You. Thank you very much for inviting me and a huge thanks for what you do. Thank you. Well, likewise. <laughs> Thank you.